Chapter 20, A Scream in the Night The days were short and gray now. The nights were very dark and cold. Clouds hung low above the little house and spread low and far over the bleak prairie. Rain fell and sometimes snow was driven on the wind. Hard little bits of snow whirled in the air and scurried over the humped backs of miserable grasses. And next day the snow was gone. Every day Pa went hunting and trapping. In the cozy, firelit house, Mary and Laura helped Ma with the work. Then they sewed quilt patches. They played patty cake with Carrie, and they played hide the thimble with a piece of string in their fingers. They played cat's cradle, and they played bean porridge hot. Facing each other, they clapped their hands together and against each other's hands, keeping time while they said, bean porridge hot, bean porridge cold, bean porridge in the pot nine days old. Some like it hot, some like it cold, some like it in the pot, nine days old. I like it hot, I like it cold, I like it in the pot, nine days old. That was true. No supper was so good as the thick bean porridge flavored with a small bit of salt pork that Ma dipped onto the tin plates when Pa had come home cold and tired from his hunting. Laura liked it hot, and she liked it cold, and it was always good as long as it lasted. But it never really lasted nine days. They ate it up before that. All the time the wind blew, shrieking, howling, wailing, screaming, and mournfully sobbing. They were used to hearing the wind. All day they heard it, and at night in their sleep they knew it was blowing. But one night they heard such a terrible scream that they all woke up. Pa jumped out of bed, and Ma said, Charles, what was it? It's a woman screaming, Pa said. He was dressing as fast as he could. Sounded like it came from Scott's. Oh, what can be wrong? Ma exclaimed. Pa was putting on his boots. He put his foot in, and he put his fingers through the strap ears at the top of the long boot leg. Then he gave a mighty pull, and he stamped hard on the floor, and that boot was on. Maybe Scott is sick, he said, pulling on the other boot. You don't suppose? Ma asked. No, said Pa. I keep telling you they won't make any trouble. They're perfectly quiet and peaceable down in those camps among the buffs. Laura began to climb out of bed, but Ma said, Lie down and be still, Laura. So she lay down. Pa put on his warm, bright plaid coat and his fur cap and his muffler. He lighted the candle and the lantern, took his gun, and hurried outdoors. Before he shut the door behind him, Laura saw the night outside. It was black dark. Not one star was shining. Laura had never seen such solid darkness. Ma? What, Laura? What makes it so dark? It's going to storm, Ma answered. She pulled the latch string in and put a stick of wood on the fire. Then she went back to bed. Go to sleep, Mary and Laura, she said. But Ma did not go to sleep, and neither did Mary and Laura. They lay wide awake and listened. They could not hear anything but the wind. Mary put her head under the quilt and whispered to Laura, Pod come back. Laura nodded her head on the pillow, but she couldn't say anything. She seemed to see Pa striding along the top of the bluff on the path that went toward Mr. Scott's house. Tiny bright spots of candlelight darted here and there from the holes cut in the little tin lantern. The little flickering lights seemed to be lost in the black dark. After a long time, Laura whispered, It must be mostly morning. And Mary nodded. All that time, they had been lying and listening to the wind, and Pa had not come back. Then high above the shrieking of the wind, they heard again that terrible scream. It seemed quite close to the house. Laura screamed, too, and leapt out of bed. Mary ducked under the covers. Ma got up and began to dress in a hurry. She put another stick of wood on the fire and told Laura to go back to bed. But Laura begged so hard that Ma said she could stay up. Wrap yourself in the shawl, Ma said. They stood by the fire and listened. They couldn't hear anything but the wind, and they could not do anything, but at least they were not lying down in bed. Suddenly, fists pounded on the door, and Pa shouted, Let me in! Quick, Caroline! Ma opened the door, and Pa slammed it quickly behind him. He was out of breath. He pushed back his cap and said, Whew! I'm scared yet! What was it, Charles? said Ma. A panther, Pa said. He had hurried as fast as he could to go to Mr. Scott's. When he got there, the house was dark and everything was quiet. 
Pa went all around the house, listening and looking with the lantern. He could not find a sign of anything wrong, so he felt like a fool to think he had got up and dressed in the middle of the night and walked two miles, all because he heard the wind howl. He did not want Mr. and Mrs. Scott to know about it, so he did not wake them up. He came home as fast as he could because the wind was bitter cold, and he was hurrying along the path when he went on the edge of the bluff when all of a sudden he heard that scream right under his feet. I tell you, my hair stood up till it lifted my cap, he told Laura. I lit out for home like a scared rabbit. Where was the panther, Pa? She asked him. In a treetop, in the top of that big cottonwood that grows against the bluffs there. Pa, did it come after you? Laura asked. And he said, I don't know, Laura. Well, you're safe now, Charles, said Ma. Yes, and I'm glad of it. This is too dark a night to be out with panthers, Pa said. Now, Laura, where's my boot jack? Laura brought it to him. The boot jack was a thick oak slab with a notch in one end and a cleat across the middle of it. Laura laid it on the floor with the cleat down, and the cleat lifted up the notched end. Then Pa stood on it with one foot. He put the other foot into the notch, and the notch held the boot by the heel while Pa pulled his foot out. Then he pulled off his other boot the same way. The boots clung tightly, but they had to come off. Laura watched him do this, and then she asked, Would a panther carry off a little girl, Pa? Yeah, said Pa, and kill her and eat her too. You and Mary must stay in the house till I shoot that panther. As soon as daylight comes, I will take my gun and go after him. All the next day, Pa hunted that panther, and he hunted the next day and the next day. He found the panther tracks, and he found the hide and bones of an antler that the pantler, panther had eaten but he did not find the panther anywhere. The panther went swiftly through treetops where it left no tracks. Pa said he would not stop till he killed that panther. He said, can't have panthers running around in a country where there are little girls, but he did not kill that panther and he did not did stop hunting it. One day in the woods, he met an Indian. They stood in the wet, cold woods and looked at each other and they could not talk because they did not know each other's words. But the Indian pointed to the panther's tracks, and he made motions with his gun to show Pa that he had killed the panther. He pointed to the treetops and to the ground to show that he had shot it out of a tree, and he motioned to the sky in west and east to say that he had killed it the day before. So that was all right. The panther was dead. Laura asked if a panther would carry off a little papoose and kill it and eat her too, and Pa said yes. Probably that was why the Indian had killed the panther. Chapter 22, Indian Jamboree. Winter ended at last. There was a soft note in the sound of the wind and the bitter cold was gone. One day, Pa said he had seen a flock of wild geese flying north. It was time to take his furs to independence. Ma said, the Indians are so near. They are perfectly friendly, said Pa. He often met Indians in the woods where he was hunting. There was nothing to fear from Indians. No. Ma said, but Laura knew that Ma was afraid of Indians. You must go, Charles, she said. You must have a plow and seeds, and you will soon be back again. Before dawn next morning, Pa hitched Pet and Patty to the wagon, loaded his furs onto it, and drove away. Laurie and Mary counted the long, empty days. One, two, three, four, and still Pa had not come home. In the morning of the fifth day, they began earnestly to watch for him. It was a sunny day. There was still a little chill in the wind, but it smelled of spring. The vast blue sky resounded the quacks of wild ducks and the honk, honk, honking of wild geese. The long dot, black dotted lines of them were all flying north. Laura and Mary played outdoors in the wild, sweet weather, and poor Jack watched them inside. He couldn't run and play anymore because he was chained. Laura and Mary tried to comfort him, but he didn't want petting. He wanted to be free again, as he used to be. Pa didn't come that morning. He didn't come that afternoon. Ma said it must have taken him a long time to trade his furs. That afternoon, Laura and Mary were playing hopscotch. They marked the lines with a stick in the muddy yard. Mary really didn't want to hop. She was almost eight years old, and she didn't think that hopscotch was a ladylike play. 
The Lord teased and coaxed and said that if they stayed outdoors, they would be sure to see Pa the minute he came from the creek bottoms. So Mary was hopping. Suddenly, she stopped on one foot and said, What's that? Laura had already heard the weird sound, and she was listening to it. She said, It's the Indians. Mary's other foot dropped, and she stood frozen still. She was scared. Laura was not exactly scared, but that sound made her feel funny. It was the sound of quite a lot of Indians chopping with their voices. It was something like the sound of an axe chopping and something like a dog barking, and it was something like a song, but not like any song that Laura had ever heard. It was a wild, fierce song, sound, but it didn't seem angry. Laura tried to hear it more clearly. She couldn't hear it very well because hills and trees and the wind were in the way, and Jack was savagely growling. Ma came outdoors and listened a minute. Then she told Mary and Laura to come into the house. Ma took Jack inside, too, and pulled into the latch string. They didn't play any more. They watched at the window and listened to the sound. It was harder to hear in the house. Sometimes they couldn't hear it. Then they heard it again. It hadn't stopped. Ma and Laura did the chores earlier than usual. They locked Bunny and the cow and calf in the stable and took the milk to the house. Ma strained it and set it away. She drew a bucket of fresh water from the well while Laura and Mary carried in wood. All the time, that sound went on. It was louder now and faster. It made Laura's heart beat fast. They all went into the house, and Ma barred the door. The latch string was already in. They wouldn't go out of the house till morning. The sun slowly sank. All around the edge of the prairie, the edge of the sky flushed pink. Firelight flickered in the dusky house, and Ma was getting supper. But Laura and Mary silently watched from the window. They saw the colors fade from everything. The land was shadowy and the sky was clear, pale gray. All the time, that sound came from the creek bottoms, louder and louder, faster and faster, and Laura's heart beat faster and louder. How she, she shouted when she heard the wagon. She ran to the door and jumped up and down, but she couldn't unbar it. Ma wouldn't let her go out. Ma went out to help Pa bring in the bundles. He came in with his arms full, and Laura and Mary clung to his sleeves and jumped on his feet. Pa laughed his jolly big laugh. Hey, hey, don't upset me. What do you think I am, a tree to climb? He dropped the bundles on the table. He hugged Laura in a big bear hug and tossed her and hugged her again. Then he hugged Mary snugly in his other arm. Listen, Pa, listen to the Indians. Why are they making that funny noise? Oh, they're having some kind of jamboree, Pa said. I heard them when I crossed the creek bottoms. Then he went out to unhitch the horses and bring in the rest of the bundles. He had got the plow he left in the stable, but he brought all the seeds into the house for safety. He had sugar, not any white sugar this time, but brown. White sugar costs too much, but he had brought a little white flour. They were cornmeal. There was cornmeal and salt and coffee and all the seeds they needed. Pa had even got seed potatoes. Laura wished they might eat the potatoes, but they must be safe to plant. Then Pa's face beamed and he opened a small paper sack. It was full of crackers. He set it on the table and he unwrapped and set beside it a glass jar full of little green cucumber pickles. I thought we'd all have a treat, he said. Laura's mouth watered and Miles' eyes shone softly at Pa. He had remembered how she longed for pickles. That wasn't all. He gave Ma a package and watched her unwrap it, and in it was enough pretty calico to make her a dress. Oh, Charles, you shouldn't. It's too much. But her face and paws were two beams of joy. Now he hung up his cap and his plaid coat on their pegs. His eyes looked sidewise at Laura and Mary, but that was all. He sat down and stretched out his legs to the fire. Mary sat down, too, and folded her hands in her lap. But Laura climbed onto Pa's knee and beat him with her fists. Where is it? Where is it? Where's my present? She said, beating him. Pa laughed his big laugh like great bells ringing. And he said, why, well, do you believe there was something in my blouse pocket? He took out an oddly shaped package and very, very slowly he opened it. You first, Mary, he said, because you are so patient. And he gave Mary a comb for her hair. And here, Flutter Budget, this is for you, he said to Laura. The combs were exactly alike. They were made of black rubber and curved to fit over the top of a little girl's head. And over the top of the comb lay a flat piece of black rubber with curved slits cut in it. And in the very middle of it, a little five-pointed star was cut out. 
A bright colored ribbon was drawn underneath, and the color showed through. The ribbon in Mary's comb was blue, and the ribbon in Laura's comb was red. Ma smoothed back their hair and slid the combs into it, and there in the golden hair exactly over the middle of Mary's forehead was a little blue star, and in Laura's brown hair over the middle of her forehead was a little red star. Laura looked at Mary's star, and Mary looked at Laura's, and then they laughed with joy. They had never had anything so pretty. Ma said, but Charles, you didn't get yourself a thing. I got myself a plow. Warm weather be here soon, and I'll be plowing. That was the happiest supper they had had for a long time. Pa was safely home again. The fried salt pork was very good after so many months of eating ducks and geese and turkeys and venison, and nothing had ever tasted so good as those crackers and the little green sour pickles. Pa told them about all the seeds. He had got seeds of turnips and carrots and onions and cabbage. He had got peas and beans and corn and wheat and tobacco and seed potatoes and watermelon seeds. He said to Ma, I tell you, Caroline, when we begin getting crops off this rich land of ours, we'll be living like kings. They had almost forgotten the noise from the Indian camp. The window shutters were closed now, and the wind was moaning in the chimney and whining around the house. They were so used to the wind that they did not hear it. But when the wind was silent in an instant, Laura heard again that wild, shrill, fast-beating sound from the Indian camps. Then Pa said something to Ma that made Laura sit very still and listen carefully. He said that folks in Independence said that the government was going to put the white settlers out of the Indian Territory. He said that Indians had been complaining and they had got that answer from Washington. Oh, Charles, no, not when we have done so much. Pa said he didn't believe it. He said, they always have let, let settlers keep the land. They'll make the Indians move on again. Didn't I get word straight from Washington that this country is going to be opened up for settlement any time now? I wish they'd settle it and stop talking about it, Ma said. After Laura was in bed, she lay awake a long time, and so did Mary. Pa and Ma sat in the firelight and candlelight reading. Pa had brought a newspaper from Kansas, and he read it to Ma. It proved that he was right. The government would not do anything to the white settlers. Whatever the sound of the wind died away. Laura could faintly hear the noise of that wild jamboree in the Indian camp. Sometimes, even above the howling of the wind, she thought she still heard those fierce yells of jubilation. Faster, 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 they made her heart beat. Hi, 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 ya, hi, ya, hi, ya.